Tonight on The Daily Debrief, startling new evidence in the case of a missing little girl from Houston. Plus... Just verbally agreed to 50-50 because they so that we could just go home. Trembling testimony from the mother of a defendant's child. Does it help him prove insanity or ensure his conviction? Also, just look at the body language as prosecutors grow frustrated with a California judge's rulings. It's all part of the months-long case of the murders of a family of four. This is The Daily Debrief. It's Friday, May 10th. Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to The Debrief. Michael Bryant, Imran Ansari, along with me for the discussion tonight. Let's begin with breaking news in the case of a missing Houston girl. Malia Davis disappeared last weekend, and despite massive searches, no one has located her. Her mother's boyfriend, Darian Vance, said he and Malia were abducted while he was changing a tire on this car. He said the abductors were three men driving the girl's mother's truck. But now the girl's mother, speaking through a community activist, says surveillance footage shows Vance carrying bleach and other items out of the family's apartment. When he spoke to the mother, he told her he was cleaning up the apartment. And she didn't understand why he would be cleaning up the apartment but he went and bought an extra bottle of Clorox and came back also, that was caught on camera, buying another bottle of Clorox to clean out the apartment. We know for a fact that police did take forensic evidence out of the apartment that indicates a crime took place inside that apartment. Do you know the nature of that evidence? I know that they tested for blood samples, human tissue samples. We also have a container inside the apartment that they left where they were testing for blood and luminol in the place. And it is true that they did find physical evidence. Also, let me be clear, we believe what started this was when the mother discovered him sending pictures of his private parts to another man. Wow, explosive accusations. We will follow that case. And now to horror on the highway, where the defense has the case of a Vermont man accused of murdering five high school students. Stephen Burgoyne is facing five counts of second-degree murder, one count of aggravated operation, and one count of gross negligence. This police reconstruction video shows how authorities believe Burgoyne sped down the interstate in the wrong lane. He swerved to the left and slammed head-on into a vehicle carrying five high school friends. None of the victims of that massive crash survived. One died at age 15, the others were all 16. After the first crash, Burgoyne stole a responding police car, took off, turned around, and then caused a second crash. This is just a small piece of the squad car footage which shows Burgoyne taking off in that police SUV after the first crash. He eventually turned it around and drove back into the previous wreckage at an estimated speed of 103 miles per hour. Testifying today was Burgoyne's ex-girlfriend and the mother of his daughter. Anila Lawrence covered her face just after taking her oath and appeared to be uncontrollably shaking on the witness stand. At one point during her nearly two hours of testimony, she had to be taken off the stand to compose herself. That ex-girlfriend testified about good times and bad times. Here she describes a domestic violence incident between herself and Burgoyne. Keep in mind, this is supposed to be helping the defense case. He was angry when you got home from work? Yes. What was he angry about? Financial stuff. After this argument, did what did you do? Uh, he, he told me to leave. Take our daughter. And so what did you do? Uh, I took my daughter to put her in her car seat. And what happened? He uh, came outside and started trying to pull us out of the car. And I had to my work lanyard on and pulling that and because uh, of the, the, the t uh, type of car I have, the key doesn't have to be in anything. There's nowhere to put the key. 
push start. He was able to take the car with me in the back seat and my daughter. And what happened? I couldn't even buckle her in her car seat. I was screaming and upset. stuff and, and just kept driving and I don't even remember how long it was and uh, towards the end to, 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 to drive us into a pond and, uh, that, that's what I just verbally agreed to, to, to uh, so that we could just go home. And then I, he got in the shower and I took my daughter and I left. Wow, that's an explosive accusation from that witness. But an emergency medical technician who treated Burgoyne after the crash said the defendant acted strangely in the ambulance as well. Did he seem aware of what was happening? When he would be awake and talking, he was asking random phrases. Um, like, where am I, where are we going, or, or take me to the hospital, things like that. So he seemed confused, but he was able to speak in phrases. When he was awake and talking to me, besides the phrases that I already said, um, he seemed to be confusing me for someone else. Um, and he said things like, did you dye your hair? <clears throat> or s something about me having children. Um, he said, like, do you have two kids, things like that. Um, and I acknowledge that that was odd because I never met him prior to the incident. So Mr. Burgoyne was acting like he knew you. Mm -hmm. Overall, how did Mr. Burgoyne seem to you? Initially, when we first got to him, he seemed agitated. Um, and that was when he was pretty awake. And then in the ambulance was when it was varying. Um, uh, he just, he was asking odd questions or saying phrases that were not very consistent. One of the defendant's friends testified that the defendant came over to his house at about 4 o'clock in the morning. The defense tried to pass it off as evidence of mental illness. The state, meanwhile, cross-examined that friend and made it look like evidence of Burgoyne's sinister way of dealing with the stresses of his life. You did tell us he had been, he was pacing back and forth yes. in your house. And yeah. He, he was worried that he had walked out on his job. Correct. Concerned him. And that Anila, he was complaining again about Anila, right? Yes. She didn't want to work. And that Anila had actually threatened to take his child. Correct. Okay. And he didn't know what to do. Yes. Okay. He didn't say anything about being on some sort of governmental mission, did he, to you that night? No, I don't recall morning? it. Or so, anything about the FBI? No. Or being under surveillance? No. Joining me tonight are attorneys Imran Ansari and Michael Bryant. Gentlemen, good evening. Good to have you here on The Debrief. Good to see you, Aaron. All right, Michael, let me start with you here. So the ex-girlfriend testified that Burgoyne basically had these odd mood swings, highs and lows, and what's going on with this threat? I'm going to throw you in the back seat and take off with our kid, and I'll drive the car and crash you into a pond unless you agree to a 50-50 custody split. Is this evidence of insanity, or does this make him look like a monster in front of the jury? It definitely makes him look like a manipulator. You know, he's using the car, the threats, the violence to get what he wants, and it works. So I don't think it helps him look crazy. It helps him look pretty darn smart. Imran Ansari, you're nodding your head in agreement. I do. I don't think these witnesses that the defense have started out with really help their case. I think they should have started off with forensic psychiatric evidence that demonstrate that on the date of this incident, the defendant went three times to a hospital seeking help. I think there was some testimony or some evidence that's going to show that he was uh, sort of uh, delusional and he was uh, speaking gibberish. That was the strong evidence. I think they should have led with that. That would show possible insanity. Exactly. I was going down that same train of thought. Like, how is that ex-girlfriend a defense witness she came across like a prosecution witness would you have even thought about putting her on the stand with that kind of information there well you know i think the 
I'm going to just uh, speculate here that the defense was trying to show a background of sort of uh, erratic behavior, but I don't think it showed necessarily erratic behavior that shows insanity. Maybe someone who's disturbed, maybe someone who has uh, violent tendencies, but not necessarily insanity. I would have not led with that witness. Okay, you're the guy who does this kind of work all the time. Michael Bryant, this case is all about the insanity defense. It's a relatively low bar in Vermont. We've talked about that. But, you know, a lot of these witnesses, you can characterize it either way. Does a low bar mean the jury can just look and say, okay, we'll agree that it is insanity, that that's going to be the ultimate decision here, not guilty by reason of insanity? Or is the jury going to look and say, ah, you know, I mean, give me a break. This could go either way, and I'm starting to believe the prosecution side of it. You know, when we first started looking at this case with that low bar you mentioned, we thought, you know, this is great. This is going to be a great defense verdict based on insanity. But what we're hearing now is so far from even that low bar, I cannot imagine a jury falling for it at this point. Not yet. We're starting to see a lot of agreement here on the debrief. <laughs> we need to start fighting a little bit more because still ahead on the debrief, we're back inside the courtroom for the McStay family murder case. The case has lasted months and both sides are fighting outside the presence of the jury about how the case should conclude. Those arguments are after the break. Welcome back to the debrief, ladies and gentlemen. A series of strategy fights may affect the remainder of the case of the McStay family murders. Defendant Charles Merritt is accused of killing business associate Joseph McStay and the entire McStay family back in 2010. The graves of all four of the McStays turned up in the Mojave Desert in 2013. Due to ongoing issues involving the health of an attorney, the case is officially on hold until May 21st. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second, because the defense is pointing at another suspect who had financial dealings with victim Joseph McStay. That man is Dan Kavanaugh, and the defense says nobody can find him. Here is just a small part of the steps a private investigator took on that quest. What efforts did you make to uh, subpoena Mr. Kavanaugh in February of, of 2019? I went to seven, seven different locations um, from San Diego to um, Irvine to Lemon Grove to try and locate him. Did you start in uh, in uh, the San Diego area on February twenty uh, third? Was that the first time you attempted to, uh, to locate him? Yes. Okay. And then when was the next? Well, I made two attempts to locate him on February twenty third. Both in the San Diego area. Yes. Okay. And what about after that? Uh, the next one was in Irvine. When was that? On the 24th of oh. February. Okay. And were you successful there? No. Okay. And why did you attempt in Irvine? When I looked up his Facebook page, I saw a mention of a company there, and so I decided to see if I could find him at that location. But the bottom line is Dan Kavanaugh cannot officially be found. The prosecution and the defense sparred this week over just how much the jury will be told about Kavanaugh. Without anything else, the defense gets up and says, uh, it's Kavanaugh. And the DA wants to respond. If they thought it was Kavanaugh, they could have subpoenaed him, brought him in, questioned him about all of this. They didn't do it. I think they're entitled to say we attempted to locate him to serve him and we were unable to find him. How is, how is the court going to correct the fact that when they get up in their closing argument and he argues, yeah, he's gone because he killed him and that's why we can't find him. Both sides are entitled to make that argument in closing argument, Your Honor, but it's not the proper subject for well, a witness to come in and testify about. But it's also the court is presuming that that argument is going to be made as to Mr. Kavanaugh. The people's position really from the beginning is that Mr. Kavanaugh has little to no relevance to this case. The court has made him relevant by allowing in certain evidence as to him, but only in a very limited nature, uh, based on his third party culpability ruling. I think it's misplaced to assume that that argument's going to be made. 
by the people. Not to mention that this defense attorney questioned witnesses, his computer expert. Do you know if the prosecution has subpoenaed Daniel Kavanaugh? Mm -hmm. Do you know if the prosecution has subpoenaed Lauren Knowles? Patently improper questions. Actually, unethical violates rules of professional conduct questions. But that's besides the point, Your Honor. That fight went on with a number of what-ifs and speculative scenarios after the judge said he would allow the defense to mention its inability to locate Kavanaugh and apparently Kavanaugh's ex-girlfriend. Can I inquire as well, to what the rationalization is for allowing them to inquire of a witness about their own witness that they got up in opening statement and said, hey, this witness is going to come in and tell you all of this. They're the ones that sequestered a drug addict away somewhere and counted on her to be able to come in here and give information about this case. How is it that the court is going to allow them to delve into that? I don't see how it proves or disproves the fact that Well, I mean, that might open the door to what the contacts with that, that particular witness were prior to the attempts, either prior to or subsequent to the attempts to serve a subpoena. Which is going to involve other witnesses being called. Including potentially Mr. Moline, since he's the one that interviewed her in San Diego. Well, I don't think we're going to do that. The prosecution kept pushing back at the judge. Look at the body language in this exchange. My issue is they're entitled to put on evidence to explain that witnesses that, number one, would seem to be logical witnesses to call or that they mentioned in their opening statement uh, why they're not being called. Opening I'm statements. Willing, if counsel wants an opportunity to find any case authority one way or the other uh, to, uh, that, that would indicate that's either proper or not proper, I'm, I'd be willing to look at that. But, Okay. I'm not sure why we give an instruction to the jury then that opening statements are not evidence. And then, then we, can we call someone to say why a video clip from a press conference was not coming into evidence that was shown in opening statement over our objection? I mean, it, this, this is a path that when you when you go down the opening statement path, that, that's a problem. And, and they showed a video of a press conference they knew wasn't going to be admissible. I objected at the time. The court overruled my objection. Can I now call a legal expert to say, well, that's not, that there's there's no foundation for that. It's not relevant to anything. Or a legal expert to explain why Dan Kavanaugh would likely invoke his fifth amendment privilege given the uh, unethical press coverage that the defense has blabbed about his court. Well, the defense would probably like the idea that Kavanaugh would take the fifth amendment. <laughs> right, but see the morass you get into? I mean, if you, if you, I think what Mr. Dowdy is saying, when you open that one door, you open a whole bunch of others that gets way far afield of anything that's relevant for the jury to consider, uh, given the court's instructions it's going to give. Well, um, as I say, I'll allow both sides to uh, some time to do some research on that. A skirmish over delays in this trial. Here's the fight over those delays, including a swipe at the defense claims that defense attorney James McGee has had to delay the case due to health issues. These are starting to appear like intentional stall tactics where you don't have experts completing work until the night before they testify, even though they've had the case for three, four, five years. Can you imagine, then also, can you imagine who's saying this, Your Honor? I mean, can you really imagine? Well, every expert that the defense has called has provided their report the day of, the day of or the day before they testify. Hey, that's, that's, Your Honor, uh, our accountant provided it in July. Why are those comments directed at us? Why shouldn't those comments be directed at the prosecution, who hired an expert in the middle of trial? We took almost the entire month of March off due to their scheduling of witness issues. Now we've taken what is mounting to going to be two, two and a half weeks off for Mr. McGee. Well, four weeks. 
versus Mr. Moline's preparedness, which I sincerely question considering I happened to be at a social event with Mr. McGee on Saturday where he was perfectly fine drinking and dancing. Wow. There's a lot to talk about there. Attorneys Imran Ansari and Michael Bryan are here once again to weigh in on this. So Imran, you practice in front of judges every single day. Would you stand up and turn your back and fold your arms at a judge while a judge is addressing the argument you just made? Absolutely not if I ever want to set foot in that courtroom again. Um, I find, you know, they were getting up and sort of pacing around the courtroom a lot. Maybe California is a little more relaxed than here in New York because I could tell you if you know, an attorney gets up uh, in a New York courtroom, in a New York City courtroom, and starts, you know, meandering around while, you know, the judge is addressing opposing counsel. You're not going to have a, a good day in court that day. You're going to be told, counselor, sit down. At least that's my experience. Yeah, I mean, you respect the judge's ruling, even if you disagree with it. Okay, if you disagree, lay your record and then bring it up on appeal. Michael Bryant, the state there said, Mr. Kavanaugh has little to no relevance to this case. Well, really? We've had, uh, yeah, really? really? We've had okay. a lot of things here. Look, and, and I'm not passing judgment on whether or not he did anything, but when you're trying to try a guy for four murders, including two little kids, and you want to send him to death row, then he ought to have any chance he's got to defend himself Of here. course, and what the prosecution is so upset about is the fact that they were allowed to put on a witness to talk about how they couldn't find Kavanaugh. And that would arguably be a little irrelevant, but... The judge said, hey, they got to mention in the opening statement he was going to testify. If he doesn't testify, this jury needs to know why or they're going to hold it against the defense. Yeah, okay, so that's the way the judge wanted to deal with that. And, you know, they're trying to throw these roadblocks in the way. But a defendant, Imran, has a constitutional right to present a defense. And the judge that I clerked for said, look, give the defense a long leash, a broad leeway when it comes to these evidence rules because of that constitutional right. Right. Because if there's any sort of uh, inkling that that constitutional right has been somehow, uh, you know, frowned upon or, or inhibited in any way, you're going to be facing it on appeal. So the judges have to give a, a great leeway to the defense. Remember, a defendant has a right to appeal. Prosecution does not. No double jeopardy. So that's why judges tend to give the defendant more uh, leeway when they're presenting a defense. And that's the way this case is rolled out. Guys, want to appreciate you for uh, joining us here tonight Thanks, on sir. The Debrief because we're going to continue to follow that case and the others when we return next week. You can join us on The Debrief at 5 o'clock Eastern. Our live trial coverage begins Monday at 9 Eastern. Have a good weekend.